And it's a holy emoji. Holy emoji reaction. So first of all, Jim, how do you feel about getting the coveted holy emoji reaction to Cold Civil War? <laughs> I think that's right. I mean, ultimately, the goal of the book is to be optimistic and hopeful. I mean, I there's a part of the book that is a is a, you know a, I'm trying to understand the, the the polarization in the cults of a war. So there's a negative aspect of the book, but ultimately, the the last third of the book is uh, is positive and hopeful and say this is this is how we could come together. This, but this is what would and this is what would unify us. And I ultimately think that at the core of that is going to be the church. Uh, it's going to be Christianity that's going to empower kind of what I call a new vital center. So it's perfect. I love the emoji. Love it. Okay, so we're on good track for this. So, Jim, before I ask any other question, this is going to be a little heavy, but here we go. Is America worth saving? Yo, yeah, I mean, there are days where you don't feel that way, right? When you, you know, you see some of the things that our, our ruling elites do, um, you know, when you kind of peek under under the hood, um, you look at our history, some of the things that have gone on, you think no, and you look at the division and you're, you know, but, but ultimately, yeah, I mean, I, this is still the place that all migrants and immigrants from around the world want to come. And there is a reason they want to come here because they're still at its core, is something special about the American experiment. Um, it may be under siege, but I think it can be recovered. Um, but it still is the beacon of hope for a lot of oppressed uh, people around the world. And they vote with their feet. They want to come here because this is a place worth saving. So absolutely. Wow. What a great answer, Jim. That's super helpful. Okay. So Now, just tell us a little bit about yourself, Jim. Let's get to know you, like, in three sentences, who you are and what you do. Yeah, I mean, I, so I've been an educator most of my life. You know, I pursued graduate school in my 20s, both a theological degree and a political philosophy degree, so a Ph.D., um, I've pastored, I've educated in colleges, I've been a college president, and I've written three books, one on the church, one on kind of the, uh, the you know, spiritual formation, and then this one on politics. And awesome. I, have a, I have a wife and I have four awesome kids. Awesome. Wow. That's amazing. Four, four kids. I have three. So, you know, that's I stop at the third. We got two, two boys and a girl. So yeah, go. having yeah. kids, having kids, it's always a joy. And yeah. I'll, I'll bring it back in a little bit because when you talk about immigration, I have a story <laughs> that I want to tell you about. Um, but let's start right here right now for the episode. So this is what I want to do. Uh, I have like the outline of what I want to talk about today, if you will. So yeah, one would be awesome. like, what is wrong with America? Like the basically, what do you mean by cold civil war? Then mm -hmm. we can maybe talk about what is a public philosophy. And then you have this, this theme by um, Christian Smith who says narratives have something in common. And then yeah. I put in parentheses like persuasion. So I love that idea. I love that concept. So I would love to talk about those. And then we'll bring the new vital center quadrant, which is a breakthrough, I think, in your, in, in your discovery in this book. And then at the very end, I, I, I want to bring my own quadrant that I, I feel like, man, together we can save America, right? So <laughs> we'll blend the quadrants and then we'll be good. You know, we'll save, you we'll go. save America. So first of yeah. all, let's start right here. Um, what is wrong with America? What is the cold civil yeah. war? Yeah. So the cold civil war is a, a, a phrase that, that I borrow from a guy named Victor Davis Hanson. Um, or actually he probably borrowed it from Angela Cotavia who, who just passed away untimely, but it's this idea that, that there's a, there is a type of civil war going on, but it's not hot. Right. So we're not shooting each other yet. Uh, there's no military tanks involved. Uh, there's no armies warring against each other the way we had in, you know, the, the, the civil war in the South. Um, but it's but it's but it is a civil war nonetheless. There are major major differences dividing us. So even though it's cold at this point, um, there it, there could be flare ups or something that sparks it. And so partly what I'm trying to do is avoid that by writing this book. But at the very heart of the the civil war uh, 
is a division on how we see our country. So I talk about in the book there, you know, there are two constitutions, two visions of America. Uh, There are two ways of looking at things, right? There are two, we have different hopes, different desires, things, the different things that hold us together. And it just seems like over the last 50 years, the country is becoming more and more divided. And I use that fancy term polarization, um, that we're being polarized and we can't even talk. And I quote, um, a conservative columnist named Matt Walsh, who says the bridge that we used to be able to walk across to meet the per- the other side on is just gone. There's no, it doesn't seem like there's any bridge. I mean, we can kind of lob rhetorical bombs at one another, but there's no bridge to walk across. That's his contention. And I partly agree, but I, I think there's enough of that bridge left. It, you know, that it may have a, a bombed out section here and there, but we can kind of weave our way across to meet the people on the other side who have a different vision for America. Um, I mean, I, I have to say that because ultimately I'm, I'm hopeful, as I said, but that's the division. And then I spend almost, the, you know, I spend the first half of the book, maybe more talking about how we lost a vital center, this commonality that through the 50s at least was still holding us together and how over the last 30 or 40 years that that division has just really widened. Um, and I use the quadrant system to point that out and, and demonstrate how we've really, everything has moved out to the margins, to the edges, uh, as far as extreme as we can get. Uh, and that's causing even more of this disunity and the hatred that we experience between the two sides. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I, I totally see that. And I'm going to be a little funky right now, but there's, you know how we live in a world of memes, right? Mm-hmm. The, the memes everywhere. And I'm from Mexico. I'm, I'm, Mexican, so uh, Mexicans, we do a lot of memes, and you know I have Facebook, and I see my my friends from Mexico putting memes all the time. So, anyways, there was this Facebook post at some point, and this might have been you know a few years back, like I don't know, two years back, and you know Mexico has has its own politics, right? Uh, and you know there's left and right, and the neo this, neo that, and I mean similar to the U.S. But nonetheless, you know, people, whenever there's a new president in Mexico, which is every six years, um, there's also this battle, right, between, okay, you know, who are you going to vote for? And now people alienating themselves even more to the side. So I almost like noticed the same thing that was happening here in America. But then this meme pops up (laughs) and the meme is something along the lines of, you know, there's a picture of a great a great platter with food on it. Mm -hmm. And then it almost goes, goes along the lines of like, you know, whether you voted for this guy or whether you voted for that guy, get to work and enjoy the food, right? Like you won't have this big piece of meal, this nice, amazing piece of meal if you don't even work. Right. So, I mean, I I saw it. I'm like, yeah, there's something to that. Even though now when I read the book, I'm like, you would probably place even that idea in one of the quadrants But my point is, when we think of what's happening in America and in the world, well, one is, is what happening in America unique to America, you think? Or are we living times where, you know, the globalized world is pretty much experiencing the same? And, you know, you even said you were in Europe. So I don't know if you have some to speak on on that or... I know the book is about America, right? But how do you see yeah, that yeah, in yeah. relationship yeah, to I, the you world? Know, I do, yeah, you know, that's perceptive. I appreciate that. I mean, I, I talk about in the book, particularly when I focus on the quadrants that would hit the libertarian right, you know, the, the, um, the pro-business, pro-globalization, right? The, the open borders, the, the, the ones that want uh, all the interaction with, with China. So I, there, I talk about those. There, no, there is a movement kind of worldwide where the kind of the globalization, the economic globalization, the cultural, the political globalization that has kind of homogenized the world and has been led by, you know, the 1%, the ruling elite um, across countries, uh, there is kind of a pushback. And we saw that during the pandemic and the lockdown. So everywhere around Europe, you were seeing people just as frustrated like people were in Canada or America with the kind of draconian lockdowns that were stealing all their freedom, you know, closing churches, not allowing people to meet, locking people in their homes. I've heard all kinds of stories over here about uh, that it was even much, much worse than even uh, some of the places in, 
in our country that were pretty strict that you know, they weren't even allowed to to walk to the next block or they were going to get arrested. So I think there's a, there's been a real pushback to the, the, the kind of the elite that's been running this on a world level. And, and they all, it, it's amazing, isn't it? That how in the, the response to the pandemic was similar in most of the countries of the world, or at least the Western countries. And it was almost like it was coordinated. Like, how did they all come up with the same ideas so quickly and so fast? And I think people are, have then also then kind of pushed back and said, hey, we're, we're losing our freedoms. And, and just now in Europe, people are starting to say, uh, starting to, those are starting to roll back where, where people are starting to get back their freedoms. And we've watched that. We've been over here a couple months and we've seen it kind of open up uh, as we go. So no, there is there are connections. Um, I don't think... I'm not sure this is the place to go for this interview, but there are, you can see a lot of what's going on in the battle uh, with the, the Ukrainian, the Russian invasion of Ukraine as well. There's these forces that are going on in our country also are impacting the world as well. Mm. Yeah, that's so true. And as I'm talking to people, you know, even my friends in Mexico yesterday, this weekend, uh, some of them were saying, I mean, isn't the, the whole thing with the pandemic so interesting? Honestly, I feel like, man, the Super Bowl came and it's like the pandemic is over. And then the war hits. It's like, wow, nobody's even thinking about the pandemic. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, that's to, right. Today, yeah, what yeah. Yeah. today yeah, my kids, did. for the first time, they're maskless in school, right? It's like yeah. today is the day, this Monday. It's like I look back and like it's been two years. It's yeah, been well, good years. for them. And that's great for them. Those that is That should never have happened with children. So, mm. Yeah, I'm glad they're free. So that's that's a day to rejoice. Um, yes. So they can they can see each other's faces now. They can smile. They can interact. It's yeah. awesome. So I'm so happy for them. But still, this is this is where cold civil war has a role, right? So some of our neighbors came whose kids go to the school, and I was saying, "Hey, so cool, no more mask." And they're like, "Well, our daughter, our kids, you know, I'm just gonna say our kids are gonna continue to wear in the mask, right?" And It is no so it went from you have to wear it to highly recommended, but now it created this oh, okay, so you're still gonna continue that. So I can totally see, you know, cold civil war. So when it comes to when it comes to ideologies, I think you have a, a powerful phrase by Christian Smith. And I don't know if this has yes. if, if there's a connection to public philosophy. So maybe let's yeah, yeah. let's let's say can you say what is public philosophy? And then what are narratives within the persuasion? Yeah, in yeah so I, you're right. So, I, yeah, one of the early chapters I have, and this is really speaking to the church and Christian leaders and, you know, uh, influencers, um, is that there is part of the dispute that we have, the cold civil wars, we have differences over public philosophy. In other words, what is it that holds us together? What is the basis of our society? What is the grounding? How do we make choices about what is good? What is beautiful? What is true? How do we, how do we unify around certain principles? Those are all part of the public philosophy and they're what guide legislators that what that's what guides parents, school boards, whatever. Um, And, you know, sometimes we call that worldview. Sometimes we, you know, we call it a narrative. But in the area of politics, it's, I think it's helpful to call it a public philosophy because it's very specific to how we organize kind of our political and civic life together. Um, and my training is in political philosophy. And so I, my goal is to help the church not only understand what's going on, but to begin to develop their own public philosophy or to understand what what we need here and to build a confidence in that to put in the hard work you know so the so the book is as you know is not a casual read i mean it really it's going to it demands some thinking but i but i think it will reward that that thinking and that kind of uh detailed and understanding and, and you know, thinking about it in the end. But so what I do, but I also try and make it easier. Like I'm, I'm trying, this is a, a, for the general public. It's for, it's for leaders. It's for readers, right? Um, people who are influencing. And so I've got to explain it in a way where I can bring the big concepts down uh, just so they're on the level that, that everybody can understand. And so one of the help, most helpful things I discovered was this idea from Christian Smith, who is a sociologist who teaches, I think he's at, I don't know if he's still at the University of Virginia or if he's at one of, in the South somewhere, but, or he might be at Notre Dame now. Uh, but he, he, uh, he says that everybody has a narrative. Everybody has a story or a worldview. And it goes like this. Um, it's there once upon a time, there was a golden age 
And then we lost the golden age because of something. And there's an enemy that brought it on. And they're also keeping us from returning to the golden age. And what I, what I was trying to do in all the, the quadrant positions is show how every, every political position is really has a narrative story that has a, an understanding of what was the golden age? What was the best time in America? What was the best time in the West? How did we lose it? Who's responsible for losing it? Who, and those same people are usually the ones keeping us from returning to it. And then how do we get back to that golden age? And that's the, that's really the story that runs through all of the different positions. And it just becomes a handy way of kind of summarizing positions because I go over, there are a lot of them in the book. And that's, I think that's just a helpful way, hopefully of doing that. Yeah, it's super helpful. And so I love the, the idea of narrative uh because it in, it involves persuasion and you know even in some other episodes I've done this idea of persuasion has been hitting me I'm a communications guy and I feel like everything in this world is political because everything is persuasion right once you once you have an idea in your mind is how do you persuade somebody else how do I like to the simplest things how do I persuade my kids to eat their food on the table right yeah. I could do it yeah. by the rod Or I could do it by utilizing, uh, you know, kind words. I could use it by utilizing play or try to make it a game, right? So I have a, a, a three-year-old niece and she didn't want to eat. And then I'm, you know, my sister's having a hard time. And then I go, I play a game, right? And then I, I make it as if I'm going to give the food to, to her cousin, And then she's like, no, 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 the food is mine. And then I give it to her and she eats it. And then my sister like, how do you do that? <laughs> What's the technique? And it's like, it's persuasion. We just got to find persuasion, yeah. different yeah. ways to yeah, persuade. Really, everything is, there's, I think there's a book called like everything is sales, right? And ultimately, mm -hmm. you, you're, we're trying to, leadership is about that, right? Parenting is about that. We're trying to persuade people to follow us, um, you know, right? To, to come along, to be part of the team, what, whatever it is, right? So buy our product in the business world. Yeah, that's good. And that, and that's really what I was doing there too, is what I was trying to do in a sense, right. By creating the, 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 the quadrant is to say, look on the left and the right, uh, these are what the positions are, right. And mm -hmm. both the left and the right have moved into positions of polarization. Uh, and this is what they look like. And so I, I'm, I tried to be just as critical, um, as on the, for those on the left as those on the right, I was trying not to, I'm trying not to take sides, Uh, because I think they're both kind of responsible for where we've gotten. And so I think that using narrative, using that that whole idea of the golden age, loss of the golden age and how we regain it and how that runs through all the positions is a way where people can say, oh, I recognize that. Okay, that's me, you know. And what I'm hopeful is that as people read through the book, they can they they can at least say, oh, yeah, I'm right there or I'm in this position or, yeah, I'm, I'm over here. And look, both of us, and if you're talking with someone, you can both say, you know what, we're, we're actually both, at least according to Belcher's quadrant, we're, we're both outside of the vital center. Um, we have some work to do. We're, we're, we're not going to be able to get across that bridge uh, unless we come closer to uh, the new vital center, or what I call in the end of the book, the four souls of the new vital center. Um, so I, that's, I wanted that kind of aha moment for people to say, okay, all right, I recognize that we're, why we're polarized. And look, if you'll come in to the new vital center from your side, if you're on the left and you come in from on the right, there is, there is a, gr there's a great amount of things that we can agree on um, and that we can, and we can rebuild the Republic around. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with that in mind, even, even when I think of things in culture, right? Like Hollywood, when we think of pop culture, when I think of, you no, know, even things I can watch on TV, I'm like, whoa, totally. I can see even ideologies behind this or behind that. Right. And you know, there's this new word, uh, that we're utilizing here in America. It's called woke. And you can even see it portrayed in, in TV shows, right? Oh, you got to be more woke. And even one of the shows I'm thinking right now is this, um, this kids show that I watch sometimes with my kids that it's about the karate kid, but like 35 years later. <laughs> yeah, right? man, my kids just watched it. Okay. So there's this, uh, and where I, where I'm trying to pair it with is, so first they're trying to bring together two different ideologies of karate, right? One that's like, I'm going to defend myself. 
uh, no matter what. And the other one's like, I don't attack until I'm attacked and I'm a peaceful guy and this and that. And so in one part of the show, you know, there's no spoiler alerts because this was, you know, it's, it's been around for like a year already. But there's this this uh, round floating uh, wooden crate where the two guys fighting need to balance on so they don't fall in the water, right? So if they don't balance in the center, they're going to end up in the water. They, they don't get to f even fight. So the, the, the idea is once you get to, to move around this thing in connection to the person across from you, which you're battling, right? It, it, they create kind of like a dance and then you won't fall off. And I was thinking, man, that's just like an atom, right? Like an atom, it's, it's, yeah, it has yeah. the electrons and it's spinning. And if you take it, if you take one out, there's chaos, right? You have an atomic bomb. Um, so I was thinking, you had a breakthrough when it came to the new vital center quadrant. So can you, and I'm going to show it in a little bit, but can you tell us that aha moment for you when you realize, man, there's more than just left and right? Yeah. Oh, great. No, I love that. And now I, I need to, I need to watch that movie because that that's an interesting analogy. If they don't stay in the middle, they can't even, they can't even engage one another. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's, that's pretty similar, right. That we, until we get back to the new vital center, we can't eat we're, there is no engagement. We're just, we're, we fall off the edges. So, uh, yeah, it was, so I had all the way, I, I'm kind of a visual guy and I need to map things because when you're studying the history of political philosophy, I mean, it just can get overwhelming. And after a while you're like, what is who's where and what, and who's left, who's right. And, you know, you're, you're studying so many thinkers as you go through class after class, um, in, in a program. And I, so I, I just started mapping them and I started with, uh, the left right spectrum. I thought, okay, this where there's a left and there's a right, there's a liberal and there's a conservative. And I would start mapping those. And then I started running into trouble uh, because there were people on the right, like libertarians, who wanted individual freedom uh, to the extreme that I thought, well, wait a sec, these guys sound more like people on the left, particularly kind of the 60s in the hippie movement, right, who wanted no religion, no restraint, you know, John Lennon, imagine there's no religion kind of thing. And, and then, but when I was studying the left, I realized, well, you know, they're supposed to be all about freedom and personal exploration, right, and, and exploring your sexuality and no restraint. And yet I started noticing over the last 10, 15 years that the left was very much dictating in order in a good life or what they think how we should live. I mean, 20 years ago, it started in California. I noticed it where they were telling everyone they couldn't smoke anymore. Right? You couldn't smoke in restaurants. And, and it, it almost had this like, gosh, it was like fundamentalist. Uh, and I thought, well, that's interesting coming from people who are all about personal freedom. And then more and more when social justice started coming into the picture, they started dictating a lot more um, and, and getting, you know, like, like, you know, like a, like a school principal, you know, hey, you got to live this way, you got to do this. And I thought, well, this doesn't. So I, when I sat down to write the book three years ago, I started thinking, well, okay, what's going on? How do, how do I explain this? If my left, right, uh, the spectrum's not working. And that's when I, I realized, you know, what we're looking at isn't just a left, right, where left is freedom, right is more order and tradition and religion. What we're looking at is on each side, there's an order side and a freedom side. And so I turned the quadrant and I, and I drew a, a, another line to, I, I drew the, spec, uh, the, the spectrum, the one line up and then drew a quadrant uh, so I could have four. And basically what, it, what I do is there's two quadrants, right? Two parts to each side. So on the left, there's a freedom quadrant and an order quadrant. And on the right, there's a, there's a freedom quadrant and an order quadrant. So I first got that. And then I thought, well, let me see how this works. And I just kept reading. I was, I had stacks of books to try and understand what I wanted, what I needed to understand and how I wanted to explain it uh, to people. And every time I would read it, and I also had Christian Smith's narrative going through my mind, I started going, oh my gosh, this person fits here. And I would write him into the the quadrant and this person here and this person here and this person here as I every day as I was reading and studying and then I started noticing the narrative what they thought was the golden age how it been had been ruined and by who and who was keeping us from returning it and how and I started just 
putting them all in there where I had hundreds of them. I, I literally had hundreds of one. And I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to write about this? I can't talk about all these. I got to, I got to boil it down. But it was really, really, really effective. And it was a huge aha moment for me. But then what happened is as I was initially, I was just sticking them in the four quadrants. Oh, this thinker's here and this thinker's there. But then I realized that there were more extreme versions in each of the qua- the four quadrants. And so then I, I kind of bisected with a line each of the quadrants and I put a one closest to the middle, you know, to the middle and then the two and the three, as you went out to the sides. And I realized that there was, there were people who in the, in the middle really appreciated the, the old vital center and appreciated what, what the American experiment was. And as you went out to the extremes, they had no interest in returning to that or even rediscovering those types of grounding. So I started putting people in the ones, the twos and the threes. And then I discovered, and you can see this in the book, there was a huge commonality between the twos in all of the, the four quadrants and the threes out on the extreme. And I drew a circle around the threes and a circle around the twos and a circle around the one. And I realized, wow, they, even though someone might be on the right and someone on the left, if they're in the three position, they share a lot of common that share a lot in common with the other three positions that, you know, there's three others. So, and the twos and the ones, and that's how it all, it began to work. And I started seeing the similarities and I thought, oh, this is, this is really interesting. And I, and hopefully very helpful for people to understand how we've moved from the center, you know, where the two lines cross and we've moved out to the extremes and then, as I say in the book, the root kind of our ruling elite, the people who are the globalists of the world are actually kind of stoking those extremes, provoking the differences, because the further they spread them apart, the easier it is for them to increase in power. Uh, and, and when I understood that, I was like, wow, in some ways, the more we polarize and hate each other, the more we are actually giving in to the people who want that to happen. We're doing what they want. <laughs> That's the crazy thing. It's like, just stop it. Don't you understand? People who don't really like, like America are, are stoking hatred and polarizing us. And the more we can come into the new vital center, the, more, the, the less power they, those people have. You know, the oligar- I call them oligarchs or the, you know, the 1%, the, the, the cultural elites in, on, in politics and on Wall Street and in Hollywood. Um, they're, they're the ones that are, are sowing all this discord. So, yeah, it was a big insight for me. It's amazing. And, you know, I'm going to have the, the quadrant visually here on the show too. go get the book for sure. Um, but I'm going to have it. So if, if you're watching, you know, you want to you don't want to miss this part where we're going to show the quadrant and then we're going to explore a little bit of like where the main ideas fit. But I think this has been super helpful, even for me, as you said, you know, like mapping out visually wow, this is really where, where people are. But then also when you mentioned the circle, that even if you're on the extreme of the left or the right or of freedom and liberty, whatever you might be on this quadrant, it, we have commonalities. And when I was thinking of that, it's like, wow, the further you go away, uh, you know, I had this, this talk with Brian Zand and he was saying, uh, you know, some people are, it, it's just like a, a Uh, both sides of the same coin is just fundamentalism, right? It's just fundamentalism on the left or fundamentalism on the right. That's like the extreme, right? Right, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And ironically, like the, 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 as the four, the four, three, number threes, for instance, all out on the extremes and they're all kind of connected, they look similar. And yet they fight, you know, they they also fight each other. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, they, 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 they have a lot more in common than they realize, but because we're such a tribalistic society between left and right, they end up attacking each other. Um, and really what they're doing. And I talk about this in the book is as they shoot across at each other, the number three shoot across at each other in similar methods and ways, because they, they really want the same thing. They just want their side to control the, 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 the narrative, but as they shoot across, they end up, a lot of those bombs never really hit the other side and they explode in the middle. And the very thing that used to hold us together starts disintegrating, you know? Mm-hmm. So to go back, I don't use this example, but I'm kind of going with it here for the, for the podcast. But if you've got this bridge 
with someone on the other side who's you know uh, in the cold civil war and you need to walk into the middle in order to make peace or to work together um, but if you stay out on the sides of the land and you just lob bombs at each other, a lot of those land in the middle and destroy the very bridge that you wanted to walk across. Um, and, and that's what happens. We've got the left and the right kind of attacking each other, but in doing it, they're actually attacking the very bridge that we stand on, um, and which is you know, fundamental to how we, get, how we get along. And that's why that's like together they're causing the whole bridge to collapse. And of course, when we do that, we're just divided. We're, it, we can't, we don't have a country at that point. But the ruling elites really don't mind because, you know, they're, they're going to make their money on the internet. They're going to sell us stuff. You know, they're going to control us. Uh, they don't mind. I mean, look at, I mean, look what's, what's happened. All the societal destruction in the last two years, right? We've had like 30 to 40% of small businesses go out of, out of businesses. Restaurants go out, right? They've all been crushed. We have, you know, uh, all kinds of, other other economic disintegration that's taking place. Everybody seems to have gone backwards economically, except for the ruling elite. The one percent has doubled and tripled their income in the midst of a pandemic. Right? They become incredibly wealthy, and it's. I talk about how that's possible and what how that's gone on, but the reality is, it's that's what's happened. So as we destroy the bridge that could bring us together, they get incredibly wealthy and incredibly powerful. And it's ultimately because they don't, the very thing that keeps them from doing what they do, uh, the American experiment, the new vital center gets in their way. It blocks them, right? Checks and balances, good, just government, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, churches meeting, all of those things that provide kind of a block or a hedge against that kind of, you know, power all have been, uh, you know, have been whittled away and they just increase their power. Mm-hmm. And that's why that's why we're looking at a scary thing. And I think it's that that the kind of the populist movement around the world is rising up and saying, this is not this isn't helpful. This is not fair. We need to take back our our uh, we got to take back our bridge. You know, we got to rebuild it. Wow. Yeah, I would say in lay terms, to me, that sounds we are destroying the very fabric of what makes us human and the human connections. So we're yeah. bombarding that. And then, you know, I mean, if we're on a Christian podcast, I'd be like, that's what we call sin, right? But yes, yeah. uh, I feel yeah. like you. Th- this is, okay, so it's super helpful. Let's let's play a little bit and let's let's see where we end up, right? So as we think of the, of the quadrant, what are the, I mean, I kind of want you to you tell me like the, the most, like the four highest ideas on each or the one highest idea on each. And then maybe they're, they're polar, like not the polarized, but the, the far fetched version of each. And then maybe see if we can put some names in those, you know? And I, I mean, for example, right now there's, there's this thing called critical race theory, right? Yeah. And everybody is not everybody, but a lot of people are utilizing it uh, for their, from their vantage point. Right. So let's take, for example, that where where have you seen that placed in one of the four quadrants by different people or yeah, by different so, ideologies? Yeah, I actually start when I start with the, the polarized positions on the quadrant. Right. I, I actually start in the what's called the order left. Um, so this is the side or excuse me, freedom left. I start with freedom left. So this is the side of the left that really pushes freedom to the extreme. Right. So. When I was growing up and coming in age of the 70s and the 80s, this was all mostly sexual liberation, but it was about drugs. It was about just being left alone. Robert, Robert Bella in his book, Habits of the Hearts, talks about how people are breaking away from their, their small towns, their churches, their sense of you know, who they are, religion, and just kind of going out and exploring. And, and that, that, as that happened throughout the, the 70s and 80s, it then morphed while just about the time I was in grad school, it started coming in uh, in the form of postmodernism. And so remember, I wrote on this in my book, Deep Church, where postmodernism was very much the rage, even in emerging church circles. Um, but it was an attack, postmodernism really was an attack on narratives and particularly kind of the enlightenment rational narrative that wanted to see, uh, you know, uh, kind of reason as the, as the standard or scientific reason. So it kind of attacked that. 
and but then once it it that it kind of broke down truth and it broke down the ability to dialogue and i talk about that in the second position of that quadrant it eventually they realized we can't even talk i mean if there's no narratives and we're destroying all narratives and we're destroying all bridges we're standing on there's no dialogue i mean how can you even have a university and 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 it wasn't satisfying to them and so as i talk about the book they then moved into a position where they they had certain core commitments uh, that they were using to kind of go against uh, an older view of America. And eventually they reified those or the term is later, you know, they turned them into concrete or they made them more religious dogma or principles. So they went from there is no truth to these are the truths. And the truths mm-hmm. usually had to do with gender, sexuality and race. Um, and those were those positions were kind of solidified so that people could champion them and evangelize for them and make them a big deal. I think about 10 years ago, we started seeing people in the church beginning to utilize those categories, which I think is, is dangerous. I think it's good to understand them, but I think when we, when you understand that the, the grounding that they're built on, the foundation they're built on is not biblical truth. It's something different. Um, so you might, they might be against racism or, or uh, gender discrimination, Uh, the way a Christian might be, would be against those things, but for very, very different reasons. So I, in the book, I put the, I put critical race theory where I think they put themselves out on the extreme, very far from the vital center that I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah. So right now people are are looking at the the quadrant here on the screen and we just mentioned some names to kind of, to kind of see that when you have ideologies, when you push even ideologies to the limits. So you go from the vital center to position number two and then to position number three, which is like you're on the extreme of of this quadrant. Okay, so now I'm going to bring the quadrant I was working on. And this is, you know, I went back to school and then one of my, my uh, assignments was to think about, I forgot, but I, I needed to do some sort of graphic And instead of a graphic, it was yeah. almost like an aha moment, kind of like you, where where I feel like, wow, this is not linear. And even though my quadrant is right. different than you, because yours is like, if you don't balance in the middle, you fall off, right? You're on an right. extreme. So mine is a little more like the, the typical uh, graph where, but it's interesting too. So right now people are watching it and I say, we start with ignorance. Um, On the, on the quadrant. So we have on the bottom, we have ignorance. That's kind of where we start as humans, right? You don't know anything. You're pretty much in the, in the hands of everybody else to teach you anything about life. And then that line as we go up is the line that I call experience and learning. And it's going towards knowledge, right? But then at the same time, there's this other line that crosses that goes left and right and i call it the the well i call this this uh, this box the reality check right so it goes from lies to truth okay all right so i was thinking wow if you lean too much on the for example right if you are on knowledge but then you are in lies or fiction you really understand what manipulation is about because you have the understanding, you have the knowledge, but you have the lies, right? Okay, that's manipulation. <laughs> Then I thought if you are on the lower side where you're ignorant, but you're still on the left side of fiction or lies, then that's where fear kicks in because everything makes you afraid because you're you're in that ignorance level, right? If you're on the right side towards reality and truth, but you're still on the ignorance side, then I call that naivete, right? It's, uh, you're not bad, but you're just naive, <laughs> right? Now, if you're on the top side, right, which I call, um, well, I think that's where we should aim towards, uh, then we have truth and knowledge and that becomes wisdom, And I was thinking, okay, I think we want to walk towards wisdom. Now, the interesting thing on my graph is that across these two lines, I put a, a dotted line and I call it hope. 
because no matter where you're at on this on this timeline there's always the hope that you can get back on a line and then hopefully look towards wisdom which is knowledge and truth so i was thinking we're going to save america because now we have given people the tools to have a reality check right understand where you're at in your ideology and whether you're being manipulated you're living in fear you're naive or you do have the wisdom now once you understand wisdom hopefully i think it's it's a step towards building the bridge going to the yeah. vital center yeah i like that i mean yeah it's um you know you're trying to get people to a certain a certain quadrant but what i what i like about it in one sense what you're doing is almost closer to the, my chapter on public philosophy, where you're trying to figure out where our grounding comes from, right? So, um, and what you're most grounded when you have that combination of, of truth and knowledge, right? Or what did you say? It's what's yes, that quadrant? Yes, truth and knowledge. Truth and knowledge, right? When those come together, it's called wisdom. So we're talking Proverbs, we're talking the Psalms. Um, and and that's, that's really grounding. I mean, that's where the church plays the biggest role. So if I were to use your quadrant in my book, I would put it in the last chapter. I'd, I'd mm -hmm. talk about it in the public philosophy chapter, but then I would say, you know, this is really the work of the church. This is where discipleship takes place, right? This is where we want to get mature believers to be. And part of knowledge is public philosophy. Um, but you, unless you have that grounding uh, in knowledge and truth, and you're transformed by that, which is ultimately Christ. Uh, you're you're not going to see these things, right? You're not going to act on these things, and that's the kind of people um, that we need. And so, from the very beginning of our country, that you know, there's this kind of syllogism that goes like this: that the republic needs liberty, liberty needs virtue, and virtue needs religion or Christianity. And if you walk back the other way, if there's not Christianity. Right, then you're not going to have virtue, which is that the wisdom, right? And if you don't have virtue, you're not going to have liberty because people are not going to work together and live together in harmony. And if you don't have liberty, we don't have we don't have a republic. We can't live together. We're just going to fight, right? And so, really, what you're doing is it's a discipleship tool to say this is this is the place that the church needs to get their people uh, first and foremost in order so that we can be salt and light in our culture. So the last chapter I have in my book, where I talk about, uh, the heroic role of the church, that the church plays a heroic role in kind of, um, reinvigorating what I, what Robert Bella calls the external covenant. So the constitution, the Republic, what holds us together, the new vital center, it's the church and the people in it that revitalize that. So if not the covenant, this external kind of covenant that we have as Americans just falls apart and every generation, it has to be kind of re-energized. And it's really the church that I think has the ability to do that because we have, we have the best insight into, into truth and knowledge, right? Because we have the scriptures, we have the glasses, which we can even see the natural world through. And we are hopefully able to create people who who are who have who have virtue and are willing to lead into that right into into be salt and light in our culture so great good job on that <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much yeah and there's so much to that because even I, i don't know if it was your idea or where i got it from but it was like it was this sense of like once you involve the church and christianity like you said it, it was almost like but is the new vital center just all about a new theocracy, right? So if I if I was going to allow like the critics or even, you know, skeptics to say, uh, what what would be your response to that uh, before we go to our emojis? Okay, so that's a great question. I, and I actually asked that question and it, it really provided my second big aha in writing the book when I realized that I, I had to deal with religion because it had been a Christianity had been a part of our founding all the way back to the pilgrims and the Puritans. Uh, but where would I fit them in? Where they would the Christian right only in one quadrant? If I do that, then it just becomes polarized um, and it becomes a weapon. Um, and that's when I was reading James Caesar, who I mentioned earlier, he helped me up out with public philosophy. Uh, and Caesar says that early on, the, con the, the writers of the Constitution didn't put a lot of God language in because they believed that, that, that Christianity was a second constitution 
kind of running alongside of it or almost underneath the Constitution as a foundation. Um, and so they didn't want to put a lot of God language in because they didn't want that people to use that and then merge church and state again. So they wanted to keep the church and the state separate. But the mistake we've made over the last couple hundred years is saying, well, because church and state can't be merged, that the church has no role at mm -hmm. all in our culture or society. That has to stay completely private in the personal realm. And yet that's not the way the founders saw that. They saw Christianity as the very thing that breathes new life into the external covenant, which is the Constitution. And so I had mentioned earlier, uh, back to the, that syllogism, that, that the republic needs liberty, liberty needs virtue, and virtue needs religion or Christianity. That you can't have virtue without religion. And if you don't have a virtuous people, you just have war against all. Um, and Christianity was that thing. And so even, even some of the founders that weren't believers themselves understood the importance of religion. They understood the importance of church going, the other importance of, of creating virtue. And so they supported it. Um, and so this isn't about a theocracy as much as it's about Christianity coming alongside and protecting what I call what, what the founders call constitutional republicanism. Uh, and it's that constitutional republicanism that actually protects everybody's rights, including, and most importantly, minorities. Mm. Wow. Okay. That's phenomenal. That's super good insight. And so this is where I want to end, Jim. What I want to do to end the episode is I want you to come up with the most blasphemous idea to the most divine idea. So we'll walk through the emojis and you'll tell me kind of like out of these four quadrants, which ones you think personally are the most, uh, the ones you would choose for each emoji, right? So now we're going to go from like an amazing quadrant to emoji land. Uh -oh. Jim, when you think of the cold civil war, What would be the most blasphemous idea, the most far-fetched you can think of that it's out there for you personally? <laughs> I have no idea. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think. So are you using blasphemous as untrue or just kind of wild and crazy? Uh, all of the above. All of the above. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the most the craziest idea is that you know if we if we don't figure out how to walk across that bridge, um, then then we're we're heading towards a civil war, um, and I think there are people in our country who want that, um, and uh, I am totally against. I'm I'm not for that. I think that would just be devastating. Okay. Skeptical. What are you most skeptical of with, or what is the idea that makes you the most skeptical? I think the idea that makes me most skeptical is that there is a common ground. You know, I think, yeah. So I think that I'm skept skeptical that we can, we can find a commonality between the two sides that are so far apart. Wow. Okay. Let's go to Inspired. Okay, it gets better. <laughs> what makes right, you, right, right. where do you see inspiration? What inspires you? Yeah, I mean, what inspires me is that ultimately, I think there's enough goodness in, in the, the American population. They're going to recognize that this American experiment is way too valuable to throw to the side, to kick to the side, and that they're going to come back and we're going to re-energize this thing together and we're going to figure, we're going to figure it out. We're going to reclaim what is the best about the American experiment and constitutional democracy and that we're ultimately with God's help and the, and the I think the influence of the church we're going to save the republic. Okay, perfect. Now let's move on to holy holy territory. Where where do you see holiness played out in this whole civ cold civil war? Yeah, so I to me the, the holiness is yeah that's a good question. I, I guess you know in the in the in the churches uh, that didn't let the pandemic completely dictate them, in the churches and the Christians that tried to reach out to people and weren't completely captivated by fear, 
um, and worried about their own kind of personal mortality and were interested. I mean, there was just a lot of loneliness, a lot of spiritually isolated people. And I think where there was holiness, where people just said, you know, it doesn't matter if I end up dying, I'm going to die, but I've got to reach out to these people. I got to love on these people. I got to do the work of the church. And to me, those people are, were heroic. Wow. Love it. Okay. So lastly, divine. What is the most divine idea out there in this cold civil war? Uh, I think the, mo the most divine is, you know, <laughs> we're not going to solve this without God's help. Um, and you know, I think the last line of my book is may God help us, right? Can he, we're, we're going to need some divine intervention. We're going to need the church to be more heroic than it's ever been. We're going to need Christians to step up and, and, uh, and be more salt and light than they've ever been. But ultimately, right, it comes down to revival. I think the church has to experience its own revival. Um, and whenever in the history of our country, the church has gone through a revival, the most social change and the most benefit has come out of that. And so I pray that the church experiences tremendous revival and is just able to have a salt and light influence on our culture like never before. Love it. All right, my friends, what an amazing episode with Jim Belcher on the cold civil war here in America. I want to point you to ChristianPodcast.com if you want to get to know more about our episodes, more about who I am. If you want to check out our amazing emoji merch, go to ChristianPodcast.com. And Jim, where can people find more about your work, your writings and the type of work that you do? Yeah, probably the best place to go is on Substack. So jimbelcher.substack.com. I write a maybe twice weekly column so people can follow what's going on in my life and what I'm thinking and doing. And obviously they can they can go and buy the book. Uh, you know, Amazon is a good place, but Cold Civil War is now, it's coming out in like 10 days, but um, it's, a, it's available now. Um, and then I'm, you know, I'm on social media. I'm not that hard. I'm not that, I think the real, at real Jim Belcher, you can find me. The real Jim Belcher, not the avatar. There you have it, Jim. Thank you so much for being on the show. I'll see you guys on the next one. My pleasure. Great. Great.